No worries. I've just started our recording, but I know we're not one o'clock yet, so just giving everyone a heads up. We're recording now. Oh, so I got to be careful what I say is what she's telling me, huh, Shelly? Only <laughs> as careful as you were before, Michelle. <laughs> Thank, thanks for the morning. <laughs> Yay, we're getting good participation today. Yay, that's exciting. Should we give it a few more minutes before we get started? Let's see. Let's just give it, yeah, another minute or two, and then we can go ahead and get started. Okay, sounds good. Hey, Michelle, I, I do apologize. I do have to jump off around two o'clock for a, a work meeting. Nope, you're not allowed, not Austin. <laughs> I got the big <laughs> bosses in town, and I'm in the lobby of the hotel they're at, so. What? I thought I was your big boss. Come on. I have a lot of big bosses. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us for as long as you can. I appreciate it. Absolutely. And welcome back. We're, we're glad to have you back. Thank you. Glad to be back. Okay, Shelly, why don't we go ahead and uh, yep, call the right. meeting to order. All right. Good afternoon and welcome to the subcommittee meeting for technical assistance for the governor's interagency advisory council on homelessness. This meeting has been publicly noticed in compliance with Nevada's open meeting law. Chair Michelle fuller Hallauer will call the meeting to order. Good afternoon. It is April 16th. 
2024 at 1.04 p.m. And I would like to call the meeting of the Nevada Interagency Council on Homelessness Subcommittee for Technical Assistance to order. I also would like to introduce Shelly Aguilar, um, and she will be our moderator. And Shelly, would you please call roll? I would love to. Thank you, Michelle. All right, Chairwoman Michelle Fuller Hallauer. Present. Karen Van Hest. Present. Nolga Valadez. Present. Dr. Pamela Janelle. Chris Murphy. Here. Vice Chair Brooke Page. Present. Austin Pollard. Present. Christy Costa. Present. Lorena Lemus. Present. Scott Benton. And our DAG Ryan Sunga. Present. Madam Chair, we have quorum. This is Ryan Sunga. I don't count, though, towards your quorum. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Do you still have quorum even without me? Yes. Okay. All right. Oh, Michelle, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry about that. You would think after all these years of doing virtual, I would have figured out there is a mute button. Uh, so just be, uh, before we uh, call for public comment, I would just like to take a quick moment uh, to introduce uh, Shelly and let Shelly uh, speak uh, for just a moment to the to the group. Um, and let you all know um, some changes that are taking place uh, within the the uh, homeless to housing uh, team. So Shelly. Yeah. Thank you. So I am Shelly Aguilar. I work for the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. I've been with the agency for just 15 years. I just hit that last weekend. Um, and if, as of effective yesterday, the homeless to housing unit will um, be moving from Neani Cooper to um, under my uh, management. And so for the time being, I'll be facilitating the meetings and overseeing all things that are homeless to housing. Um, and I would, I know that Naomi's not here, but I would just like to express my appreciation for everything that she's done for this committee prior to me taking over. Um, and so if you guys have any communication or correspondence, if you could direct that to me, please, um, as Naomi is moving over to our eligibility and payments team. So I'm looking forward to working with all of you for the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shelly. Welcome. Um, welcome to the to the team. Uh, and Janae, I think, is on the team as well. Um, and I don't think Janae has been to any of our meetings yet. Have you, Janae? Yes, ma'am, I have. You have? I've been okay. to everyone, yeah. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Okay. So, um, so, yeah. So, welcome to the team, Shelly. And uh, we... Um, hope that you feel welcomed and uh, we will do the best that we can to help you get up to speed as quickly as possible. And uh, if there's anything that we can do to, to make that uh, transition for you as easy as possible, let us know. Uh, and uh, please send to Niani, you know, our regards. And uh, she was just phenomenal uh, in helping us and um, being a lead. So uh, we will miss her greatly. Thank you. Okay, so let's go on to item number uh, two on the agenda, which is public comment. No action may be taken upon a matter raised until the matter has been specifically added to the agenda. Comments are limited to three minutes. If you are making public comment via phone, please call 1775-321-6111. The ID number is 847-312. 658 pound. We're now open for public comment. Please unmute yourself and state your name for the council. Do we have any public comment?
Okay, there will be a second comment period at the end of the meeting. Uh, but seeing none and hearing none at this moment, I will close this agenda item and we will move on to agenda item number three. This is an action item uh, discussion and po possible approval of the minutes from March 19th, 2024 of the Interagency Council on Homelessness Technical Assistance Subcommittee meeting. Uh, is there any discussion on the minutes from our last meeting? If there's no discussion, I will take a motion to approve the minutes. This is Karen Van Hest. I make a motion to approve the minutes from March 19th, 2024. Thank you, Karen. I have a motion. Do I have a second? This is Austin Pollard for the record. I will second that motion. Okay, we have a, a motion and a second. All those in favor, please unmute yourself and indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, please un unmute yourself and indicate by saying nay. Any abstentions, please unmute yourself and indicate by saying that you abstain. I abstain. Was that Lorena? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Next agenda item is agenda item number four. Uh, this is a voting item. Uh, to vote on new members joining the ICH Technical Assistance Subcommittee from the open call uh, that was closed on March 20th, 2024. Uh, there are five community, community members who sent letters of interest to join the ICH Technical Assistance Committee members. Uh, the interested members are Donna DiCarlo, Kimberly Martin, Julie King, Adrian Babbitt, and Selena Ramirez. The uh, we have 10 members currently. Uh, we voted at our January meeting uh, to maintain a membership of 13 on this technical assistance committee. Uh, everybody received their uh, the voting ballots uh, and submitted all of the information uh, back to the homeless to housing uh, group. Do you, Shelly, do you and your team have that roster for the uh, scoring? So as things stand for the scores, our top three uh, folks that were scored are Kimberly Martin, Adrian Babbitt, and Julie King. Do we have any discussion around the scoring or the uh, roster that is in front of us? This is Brooke for the record. I, um, based on the scoring, it appears evident just based off the top three candidates um, that uh, I would like to see. A, I don't know if the motion is appropriate, but um, that our top three score applicants um, be considered uh, for consideration to be added to our committee. Thank you, Brooke. Any other discussion? This is Austin Pollard for the record. How many committee members took part in the voting? Just wanted to get an idea of that. Shall I fight me? Abigail, please. 
I'm sorry. Um, there was a total of uh, eight subcommittee who forwarded their results to us. Very good, thank you. This is Chris for the record. I agree with Brooks' recommendation. I would second that if, if it, it is if it is a motion. Any other discussion? I think what I would like, one of the questions that we have, this is Brooke for the record, we um, ask about geographic representation for our body. And I think it would be helpful to just have a matrix of to know like where our current membership is um, and and adding these new members to that, like where that would bring us in terms of geographic representation for the state. I do think that would be a good. I, I would like to see kind of what areas of the state uh, us various entities represent. Um, it, it was also useful with the scoring matrix if in the future we can get a, a clearer understanding of what areas they completely represent. I know some of them are tied, but um, I'm really grateful for the response that we got for this request to add in new mid committee mid members. Um, and I, I just, I'm thankful for everybody who did apply and send in their information and take the time to do it. It's, it's very helpful and uh, just a lot of gratitude goes up. Agreed. And I also want to remind folks that um, those that, that applied, and even if you are not uh, voted in to sit on the Technical Assistance Committee today, uh, that you are uh, welcome to continue to attend the meetings. And in the event that there is a vacancy uh, during the next year on the Technical Assistance Committee, um, we will be keeping your um, application and you, you may be called up later in the year to, and asked to join the committee. So, um, you know, the just because you know you may not be asked today uh, you may be asked in in the future so you know it's uh, don't despair and we there's a lot of work to go around and so we we definitely uh just we want you at the table um, there's just only so many seats right now at the at the voting table uh, so with that, um, I think that before we go to vote, um, we did have a, a request about um, representation. So we've got 10 members currently. Um, the current membership, I'm trying to get to my list. my list. Okay, so Karen, where do you what do you represent? I represent Northern Nevada. I'm in Reno. You're Northern Nevada. Noga, where do you represent? I am in Las Vegas. Las Vegas. Um, Dr. Janelle is, she's with the state school district, right? Uh, the Department of Education. So that's the, that's with the school, the state Department of Ed, right? So that's statewide. Um, 
And then Chris, you represent rurals, right? Yes, that's correct. Uh, Brooke? Um, I represent a statewide reach, but I'm based in North Las Vegas. Okay. Austin? Uh, both uh, Washoe County and Clark County. Okay. Uh, Christy? Christy, who do you represent? Lorena? Uh, Northern Nevada, I'm in Reno. You're in Reno. So Northern Nevada. Can anybody respond for Christy? Christy's also Reno. She's with uh, Northern Nevada Community Housing. Okay. Um, what about Scott? I know he's not on with us today. Scott was uh, with Nor Northern Nevada in the, the role that he had. Northern Nevada. Okay. Um, And quite honestly, I I joined representing Southern Nevada, but um, quite honestly, I don't know who I represent at this point because um, <laughs> I don't work for Clark County anymore. Um, and I have a contract for the rural Nevada COC, but I also have um, work otherwise. So I guess I could be statewide. I don't know. Sounds, sounds good to me. <laughs> so with that, it looks like we've got one, two, three, four, five statewide. If I count Austin, who's both Washoe and Clark, or five Northern Nevada, if we count Austin, who is both Washoe and Clark. Um, we've got to Las Vegas, if we count Austin as well, who is both Washoe and Clark. Um, we've got three statewide, if we count me as well, and uh, one in the rurals. Does that answer the question that we had about statewide representation? Yeah, and I think Brooke, for the record, what does that then take us if with our newest members, if, if we, or if, with the current slate of candidates? Uh, the current slate, um, I think Julie and Adrian. Uh, Julie is. Southern is Las Vegas, Southern Nevada. Adrienne is based in Southern Nevada, but she works for HUD. Um, and I think they have a statewide. Uh, I think they work statewide. Um, and I'm not sure about Donna, uh, about uh, Kimberly. I would have to look up Kimberly's. Need to pull up her application. Madam Chair, I'm looking at the um, the scoring summary results. There's letters attached to that, and for Kimberly, it says she's a Las Vegas native, born and raised in Vegas. Thank you. Uh huh.
Do we have the same information for Donna and Selena? Donna, I believe, is located in Sparks, Nevada. Selena is in Las Vegas, Nevada. Thank you so much. You're welcome. So with that information, does that uh, generate any discussion? Uh, Brooke, for the record, I think there's a, a lot of, it's great that we've got statewide representation. It sounded to me, though, as if Chris is our primary rural representative. And I don't know if that in of itself feels like a bit of a inequity to just have one person that's representing all of the rural communities. So I don't know if it makes sense to try to also identify somebody that's take a, a rural, you know, have more rural representation or not, but I just put that out there as a thought. Thank you, Brooke. Anybody else? This is Karen for the record. Um, so I know for our organization, Catholic Charities of Northern Nevada, we reach out all the way northern um, and went to the east, up to Jackpot, down to Pahrump, um, everywhere as far as outreach and get surveys regarding any need that are in any of the community regarding whether it be, you know, rental assistance, food, whatever their needs are. So, I mean, I don't want to say that we can. I mean, I can get information regarding the rules area. And I can work with the um, who is it? Chris, who's who's doing the rules? Chris, Chris. Um, with Chris on that, but I'd be more than willing to do that. Just your thoughts. Thank you, Karen. This is Lorena for the record. Um, I'm from Carson. And I did work in Carson for about like providing services to people out there in the quad counties. So I can also volunteer to help Chris with anything over there because I am kind of familiar with some of the services out there and stuff that's going on as far as like our unhoused populations. Any other thoughts or discussion?
Karen, um, sorry, this is uh, Karen. Brooke, does that help with any of your question there? Does it answer anything? Oh, absolutely. I think um, it's, I, I don't question any service delivery provision or the work that we all do in the rural communities. I just, from a geography perspective, just want to make sure that we are doing our due diligence with outreach and, and having folks that are, you know, if there's frontier representation that we need to have or thoughts of that, just recognizing that and um, don't want to not recognize that that's an intentionality that we put into our application process. So I just wanted to call that out. You know, um, I think, you know, the fact that we've got a slate of candidates that have applied are willing to do the work, like, I think we should definitely consider what we have at the table. Thank you. Michelle Fuller Hallauer, for the record. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to make a recommendation that uh, maybe at our, as we continue to keep our uh, opportunity for applications open that we make some deliberate outreach to folks in the rural and frontier uh, communities and um, encourage folks to apply uh, to be part of uh, the technical assistance committee. Uh, and when we do our next deliberate uh, all call, uh, that we really do a deliberate push uh, to the rural and frontier community as well, recognizing that um, there's an underrepresentation uh, on this on this committee subcommittee for for that particular um, population. I think that's work for the record. I think that's a great idea. Thanks, Michelle. Any other discussion? If not, I'm open to um, for a motion. Rick, for the record, I move that we uh, uh, vote to accept the top three applicants who have scored uh, our slate of candidates to include Kimberly Martin, Adrian Babbitt, and Julie King as new members of the Technical Assistance Committee. Thank you, Brooke. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Ms. Chris, for the record, that second that motion. Thank you, Chris. I have a motion. I have a second. Uh, all those in favor, please unmute yourself and indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, thank you. All those opposed, please unmute yourself and indicate by saying nay. Any abstention, please uh, in, unmute yourself and indicate by saying abstain. Motion carried. Welcome to the team, Kimberly, Adrian, and Julie. Are you all on the line with us? Are any of our new members with us today? Doesn't look like it. <laughs> Donna, you are here. Um, Donna, don't despair. Okay. Please continue to join us. Please be a part of, of our work. Please join our, our work teams. Uh, we appreciate you. We appreciate you uh, being at the table. And as I said, we will keep uh, your application. And um, if there is a vacancy at the any time during the year. Um, you may be called up to uh, to join us during the year. Thank you. Thank you. OK, um, <clears throat> Shelly, Abigail, Janae, will one of you guys please make sure that we send a, uh, a letter of, of uh, welcome to the members that were voted in today? 
and make sure that they know uh, when our uh, upcoming meetings are. Absolutely. Thank you. OK, with that, we will go ahead and close this agenda item and we will move on to agenda item number five, which is for information only at the moment. Uh, we will have a presentation by Austin Burrell from Civic Roundtable. Uh, just as a reminder for you all, uh, I have been in contact with Austin for, oh, I don't know, a good year and a half or more. Uh, around the product that he uh, and his team have. And I'm really excited to have him uh, present to you all today. Uh, this this product has really evolved over time. And um, I really would like uh, Austin to just talk to you about uh, this product and how it may be able to assist with communication and collaboration across systems and across uh, agencies. And so uh, we'll, I'll just let uh, Austin, you know, talk, talk to you about what he has and open things up for uh, conversation and questions. And then we can talk about, you know, what this may mean uh, going forward. So with that, I'll pass it on over to Austin. Welcome, Austin. Awesome. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Shelley. And thanks, everyone, for um, giving me the time and the space. I am so excited uh, to be with you. I know it says presentation, but I'm hoping this can be more of a conversation because being in rooms like these always teaches me and, and my team a lot about the way you all think about the work and how this collaboration platform that we're building with state agencies, ICHs, and COCs can better serve the needs of frontline practitioners um, because that's what this, this tool is all about. Um, as Michelle mentioned, have been in conversation um, for a little over a year now, um, really just better understanding the Nevada landscape um, and getting um, some real meaningful feedback on how our work has evolved in, in other states and other COCs and how it might intersect with the work that you all are doing um, on, on the subcommittee. Goals for today are first to tell you a bit about who we are, what we do. Um, second is to actually get your feedback on the product we've built. Um, and third will be to um, maybe tee up a few initial questions about um, things that our team should be thinking about or um, things that you all might think about when it comes to where this platform we're building can meet the needs of um, the subcommittee and, and the state more broadly. I know, you know you're seeing here some of the pre-read slides that I sent over. Um, I've got a few new ones that I'm hoping to share now, so I might take over screen share if that's okay. Um, that way it'll be easier to bring you all to the demo space when the time is right. All right, can everybody see my screen? I'm going to need a verbal yes because I can't yes. really see anybody else. <laughs> OK, thank you. Um, so quick agenda uh, reintroduction, because as Michelle mentioned, we've been in conversation for some time. Um, today I'll be other Austin because I know there's an Austin on this call, so I'm not going to duke it out. Um, talk you through the demo, the roadmap, um, and bring you a bit into kind of the way that we think about our, our deployment strategy. At a high level, um, what we do is create um, an intranet for state agencies and COCs to coordinate with their frontline. Um, that is both in the context of committees and working groups like you all, making sure that you can stay in contact in between some of your synchronous meetings like this one over Teams or in person. Um, and make sure that there are better ways to build institutional memory. That way, some combination of Michelle and, and, and Shelly aren't always chasing you down with meeting minutes, agenda items, questions. We want to give you a space to actually do that in real time and, and all the time. What that lays the foundation for uh, historically has been two things. One, actually creating similar central hubs of communication, not just for ICHs and boards, but for COCs specifically. Um, you can think of that as, you know, what I said earlier, an intranet um, for the way that different agencies and providers operate within a COC. And of course, that also can scale statewide. Um, this is work, as you see in the corner here, that we're doing with a number of agencies, both governmental and nonprofit, in Connecticut, in Arizona, in Oregon, and most recently in Maryland, DC, and Virginia. Um, and the hope with these conversations 
um, like the one we're having today is really first to get your feedback on the vision, see how it resonates with the way you all experience the challenges of coordination and collaboration across the state. Um, and second, making sure that the product that we're building is not only useful to the organizations you're seeing in the, in the bottom right hand corner here. Um, everything we've built has been informed directly by the users that we work with, both those COC and ICH leaders, as well as street outreach workers and frontline staff. Um, so we take your feedback seriously um, and we really, really do love um, these conversations. So hoping that the demo really opens up the, um, opens up the floor to folks to kind of chime in and share ways they might see this sort of tool and, and this ecosystem come to life. What this is at a high level is a collaboration platform that is purpose built for the public sector and partners of government. Um, I know many folks in this room represent many of those perspectives, both regionally and functionally. Um, and as you all know, homelessness is one of those issues that is fundamentally um, cross sector, multi stakeholder. It really takes a village, not just whole of government, but whole of community um, to actually tackle the challenge that you're all up against. Um, and I know you all know that's especially true when it comes to getting technical assistance in the hands of those who need it. So what this tool is really focused on is four core things. The first is reaching the entire network of practitioners that would be thinking about homelessness prevention and response in the state of Nevada. Um, that first starts with those serving on committees and working groups like you all are and you know, other groups at the um, ICH. That also then extends to service providers and partners that are working either with state agencies or within COCs at the local level. Second would be facilitating organic collaboration so that it's not only those COC leaders or state agency leaders that are you know, giving directives into the field. We wanna make sure that peer agencies, peer providers can learn from each other over time. Um, that way people can really benefit from the expertise and the experience that exists in the field, both lived experience and um, you know, those practitioners that have been serving for, for decades. What that does over time is the third bullet here, um, build a knowledge base. We see that as fundamental to the role of technical assistance because TA needs to build on some source of shared knowledge. Um, you can think of this as maybe uh, the vision of what a Wikipedia for homelessness in Nevada might look like. It's in the spirit of making sure that you can find all of your statutes, all of your resources, all of your guidance in one place whether you are a member of an ICH or a street outreach worker in Reno. Um, so making sure that that knowledge is accessible by everybody and especially for new folks that are just coming into the work given how much turnover um, we see exist at the local level. Last but not least, what this all amounts to is a way for state agencies and ICHs to actually get some real feedback from folks in the field. Um, when we say real-time insights, what we mean is um, analytics behind the platform that can show you what your communities are talking about, whether it's in the context of a specific subcommittee or a specific COC or an interstate working group. Um, it's through this tool that we've been able to give COCs and state agencies in Connecticut and Arizona and Oregon a better sense of what's happening on the ground. Um, and our hope is that you know, we'll be able to do the same for you all as you um, inform your strategic plan and think about what priorities for the state ought to be in the, in the near to long term. Um, I'll pause there for now. What I wanna do next is bring you into the product so that you all can see what this looks like in action. Um, Cause a lot of this is really about visual learning too. Um, but before I do that, I um, wanted to open up the floor to see if folks had any initial reactions, questions, um, or ideas of things they wanted to focus on just so I know how to make the most of our time together. Hi Austin, my name is Brooke. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I was curious how you are able to gain buy-in from multiple different um, entities to support this platform. If you've got different interests, different sort of decision makers. It's a great question. And there's a different answer for every COC and state agency we work with. Um, I know you know this <laughs> better than I do. Um, the way we think about our work is actually starting with a specific problem uh, to solve with a specific group of people, um, which is why that initial bucket of working groups and cohorts often makes the most sense. That's where we're able to save time really quickly um, by reducing the number of meetings that folks need to have 
and making groups like yours feel more connected to each other over time rather than needing to wait for a monthly meeting or uh, a messy listserv or email chain to actually plug in. Um, and that maybe is especially relevant for the three new members that you just elected, right? Um, they're going to be coming into this committee without much context on what you've talked about before. Um, so the, the immediate kind of value that we're bringing is giving them a space to get onboarded and up to speed because they can look back on all the conversations that have been had and all the resources that you've developed and contributed over time. Um, what that then does is give us some relevant feedback from users rather than assuming state agency leaders or COC leaders know what their practitioners in the field need. Um, so through those initial cohorts, um, whether they're committees or working groups or you know, youth provider communities of practice, which is what we launched with in Arizona, we will get a sense of what the topics that would really um, you know, compel engagement would be, and then we grow from there. Um, so it takes a really sort of gradual and intentional approach um, to then build these broader ecosystems that, um, Brooke, as you can tell, feel a bit more sort of complicated and nuanced than the initial sort of value that we're adding. I think this will also make more sense when I bring you into the demo space, um, but hopefully that gives you like an initial sense of where we like to start and how that grows into something that feels useful to both the end users on the front line, but also, you know, leaders like yourselves that are trying to see the field. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, I hope there will be more questions because I don't wanna talk at you for another 10 to 15 minutes. Um, what I'm gonna do is bring you into the demo environment we've created. This includes a number of um, existing communities just to give you a sense of how these come to life with other agencies, ICHs, and COCs we work with, and a few demo communities that we've created with input um, from folks in this room and you know, other folks in other states. Vision for the platform is really to be first and foremost familiar um, to the range of users that you would expect to see um, come into a space like this, which means in being built for the public sector, we wanted to make sure we were building for not just folks that were new to the job and native to platforms like Slack and Teams, but also those that are, you know, serving for decades and maybe only used to some combination of listservs and, you know, have logged into Facebook a couple of times. Um, we do that because we want to make sure that we are building something that captures institutional knowledge, and we know a whole lot of that exists with those that are less familiar with this sort of technology. So when you log in, what you're meant to see is really all of the different hats that you wear as a practitioner in the field. In the context of a COC, that could mean serving on a few different committees or working groups like this one um, we recently sketched out with the city of Lincoln. Um, it could be um, in, in service of a specific role, whether it's dedicated to HMIS analysts or youth providers, um, or it could be dedicated to committees of a broader ICH like you're seeing here, um, or even more broadly, a statewide coordination hub. Um, Idea is that many of these little boxes might represent existing meetings on your calendar, um, Zoom invites, uh, listservs, you name it, that are sort of pulling people in a bunch of different directions. And what we're trying to do with this ecosystem is create more of a one-stop shop so that when your practitioners or your fellow committee members log in, you have access to all of the groups that are relevant to you um, and the ICH more broadly can get a better sense of what different cohorts are talking about at different times. Um, so for folks in this room, um, it could save you time um, by giving you a place to log in, keep track of all your meeting minutes, all of the conversations and questions that your members are asking, um, and capture all the resources that you're contributing to inform this broader plan that you're building towards. Um, it can also you know, turn into communities that you all ultimately manage, whether you want to create a technical assistance group focused on the rural COC or on youth providers. Um, so it becomes not just a space for you all to kind of engage and get time back, but also a way to streamline coordination across some of the initiatives that might stem from the strategic plan. The other thing I'll say about these boxes is that they're all permission-based. Again, being built for the public sector means we wanna make sure that this environment is secure um, and easy to navigate, um, but only the right information gets to the right people. So it's not as if anybody from Nevada would get to see what goes on in Nebraska or Connecticut. 
um, all of the communities are permission based. And that means folks like Shelly and Michelle um, get to decide who gets in and who gets out. Um, and that means that your average you know, user who might be able to join a public meeting like this um, would only be able to kind of observe what happens in these practitioner communities if they were authorized or invited to join, um, which is something that we're able to do. I'll bring you into just one of these demo communities to give you a sense of what this looks like. Um, you know, the proxy here might be that this is uh, a, a group that might resemble the technical assistance subcommittee, but in this context, it's, you know, housed at the, you know, CD of CO, um, the city of Lincoln COC. Um, every community has uh, a description, a welcome mat, um, gives people a sense of what this is and, and where they are. Um, again, this is another group that has a monthly meeting. Um, so the idea of this, this you know, platform is to um, be the glue in between the Zoom meetings that they have so that their members feel plugged into the conversation over time. Um, every community has a few core components, the first being a feed. This is where we're more or less modernizing the listserv and making sure that um, content, questions, polls, and surveys don't get totally drowned out if they're sent out over email. Um, so what we're trying to do is reduce the traffic that you get in your inbox and make sure that you can more easily search for things, whether it's, you know, a quick um, click to see, hey, here are all the past agendas of the meetings that I've been a part of, um, or potentially a search by maybe author um, or organization that you want to learn from. Um, so this is our way of making it a little easier to search through what typically might land in your inbox, but what now feels like a more dynamic um, you know, community approach to the way these conversations really do happen. Next thing I wanted to highlight is the member directory, which is where we're providing some real context around who is actually in these communities. What I'll do here is bring you into our Arizona community so you get a sense of what this looks like in action. Um, what a lot of folks end up using this as is effectively a Facebook or a LinkedIn where you can jump into the community and filter for peers with similar skills or interests. You can also find people by organization they work for or maybe hat that they wear. And this is in the spirit of making sure that you all have a good sense of what organizations are represented in the room as, you know, um, I know Michelle walked you through earlier today, making sure that those perspectives are um, actually contributing to the conversation that's being had. Uh, but more tactically, if you were in a technical assistance community and you really quickly wanted to learn from somebody who um, has experience running a point in time count, or um, evaluating a program, you could actually click on a tag like that and direct message folks who have some experience with the topic that you're trying to learn about. And this is in the spirit of cultivating those point to point and people to people communications, rather than making only those who serve on technical assistance committees um, be sort of the gatekeepers of knowledge and connection. Next up is the resource library. This is where we're consolidating all of the content that you see gets uploaded here as attachments to posts or comments. Um, it gets dumped into what is a, a more searchable and interactive version of a resource library. I think the status quo for a lot of people is just trying to dig through email or finding some random website or shared drive to sort through. And it can be really hard to know what's relevant, who posted what, when and why they posted it. So what we're doing here is creating a more searchable way to do that. So if you wanted to jump in and find all content related to YHDP, you could click on that tag and see that Austin and Haley post about it, posted about this stuff last year. And if you wanted to actually join the conversation about some content that was shared in the past, you could click on that tag and immediately jump back in, ask Haley a question about what she meant by the application and um, you know how you can actually adapt it maybe for the current cycle. What this also does on the back end is give the COC or state agency or ICH the ability to understand how people engage over time. Um, so all of the tags you're seeing here and the ones that you're seeing in the feed help inform um, some set of analytics that gives you a view into, hey, here are the five trending topics that are coming up within this COC or this region. Or, hey, we're getting a lot of questions about this new program or this piece of legislation, so we might need to put out a new resource or a new guide to get people up to speed. Same goes for the resources, right? If you want to get a sense of what people are actually looking at, if you invest a lot of time in developing a strategic plan or putting out a, a white paper or a template, this is our, our way of actually giving you that feedback to better understand what people are actually um, taking forward in the work that they do. 
Last but not least is the events function. This is where we're basically documenting um, the meetings and deadlines that people are running towards. Um, so this is where, for example, in the context of this subcommittee, you might have a list of you know, upcoming meetings or deadlines that you want people to you know, keep track of. Um, it could also be where maybe you advertise some opportunities for folks from the public to engage with what you're putting out. Um, so again, really just giving people that shared calendar and view of what's relevant to them day to day. The hope with all this is that it's really meant to be custom to the needs of each user, right? So when you know somebody from this group logs in, they might only have access to a handful of relevant communities, whether it's based on the committees or subcommittees they serve on, or the regions and COCs that they work with, um, or the topics they work on. Another thing that we're really leaning into is the sense of personalizing notifications. So if you wanted to only receive updates in the form of a weekly digest or a daily digest, you would be able to get sort of a top line view of what people are actually talking about, either in the context of the subcommittee or across the COC. Um, so it doesn't really pull you out of the flow of work as emails or Teams and Slack often do, but it's just a way to give you a digest of, hey, here's what's on people's minds and here's you know, how you might wanna plug in and, and provide some support. Um, so all that to say, um, building this very much to meet that coordination challenge head on, um, both in the context of specific committees and working groups like yours, but also um, across COCs and states more broadly. I'll pause there. Um, do have a few other um, you know, roadmap features I could walk you through, but wanna make sure that I'm answering questions about the current state of the product before um, going any further. Thank you, Austin Brooke again. Appreciate this. Um, it feels very um, and like coordinated amongst all of these different programs and systems, and it feels very individualized as far as your login and the things that you're um, interfacing with. If you only have, if you're only a part of this organization, um, if you like uh, this committee, but let's say the COC is public, the COC has public information. Would the COC's public information be a part of this platform because it's public information or would they have to opt in to be a part of this platform? If if it's like something that, you know, the integration we started off with this committee, this action plan, but things that were public, would they also be able to access it through this platform? You would be able to access it, um, but you might be taking a different approach with the different communities that you create and enter, right? And that's the benefit mm -hmm. of having these sort of walled gardens and the way that we can structure the ecosystem. Um, so there might be a world where the ICH or um, you know state agency is running a number of communities that are available to folks statewide. There might be another instance where within that same homepage, you have access to communities that your COC owns and runs. And those might have different terms and conditions when it comes to the types of information that they're allowed to share and who's allowed to access it. Um, mm. You know, for example, um, in our in our work in Oregon, what we've got up and running today are uh, a bunch of these different local homeless councils that are emerging across the balance of state COC. Um, so those are very much permission based, um, accessible only to those serving on specific committees or task forces across um, the COC. And what that is building towards is actually a set of communities that would be more public facing so that, you know, members and community members, right, of that COC could actually engage with members of the local homeless council. Um, so we typically start with something that feels more internal, right, to practitioners that are um, actually advancing the work of prevention and response. Um, but over time, what we can build towards is a model that might include different interagency use cases or um, some public facing use cases, too. It all just mm. depends on who you decide to authorize access to. Mm, that makes sense. And in your other communities, do you interface with your homeless management information systems at all? Or are those like separate kind of just uh, obviously major databases, but do they ever intertwine with what uh, your communities and processes and like data access with your system? 
Yeah, so we, we are building to be interoperable today. What that looks like is really just having dedicated cohorts for HMIS analysts to communicate out about the work they do in HMIS. I think the challenge we often hear from end users that are focused on, on that system is that it's not really for public consumption a lot of the time. Um, mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do is give them um, basically a space where they can talk about talking about the work and then a separate space where they can communicate trends and insights that they're learning from the system to folks that might not really know how to navigate HMIS on their own. Um, mm -hmm. So that's how we think about it, right? It's not as if our platform today is housing any of the information that HMIS does, right? You know, PHI, PII is not in Roundtable today. That's all for case conferencing systems in HMIS, um, but we've been able to find um, a, a meaningful role to play in the way that HMIS analysts can organize around their work in, in terms of training or um, communication to other parts of their respective state agencies or COCs. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Austin, uh, Michelle Fuller, Hell Hour for the record. Uh, this is a, you know, a, a state open meeting and we have to adhere to open meeting law and uh, we have to worry about walking quorum when we are out of out of this meeting right even when we have email communications or if we are out in the community and there there's a gathering of us we have to be we have to be cautious of too many of us that are on this committee being in the same space at the same time so uh have you had to deal with that with the round table and if so how do you do that how do we how do we how do we get around not get around that but how do we prevent having running into uh walking quorum if i'm understanding the question correctly we've come up against this in the context of a few different arenas of our work some with the, you know the state agencies we work with and their committees others actually in the context of some work we're doing at the federal level um, the way that our communities are structured, uh, each agency or organization that owns a specific space gets to decide um, how to treat the communications within that space, right? So, you know, for example, um, if you wanted to treat everything in your roundtable community like email, that means it's subject to public records requests. We could make it really easy for you to pull the relevant information and submit that to folks that are interested in learning more. Um, you could also, you know, for instance, open up one of the committee communities to include members of the public um, in the spirit of making sure that folks can participate and understand um, what's going on um, and have a more transparent approach to those conversations. Um, so that's another option, right? Just making sure that the rules of the road for these communities are, are, are as clear as they are in the context of these conversations and that it's easier for members of the community and the public that wanna learn about what's going on um, can plug in. Um, to what's specifically relevant to them. And that is for the admins of each of these committees and sub communities to decide for, for themselves. Um, I'm gonna, I'm not sure if that actually answered the question or not. Ryan, can I ask you to kind of uh, jump in here and see if, What's your question? Well, I I know that you have helped us around ensuring that we don't we don't run up against uh, walking quorum, and mm -hmm. I want to make sure that what um, Austin is proposing with the roundtable platform isn't going to get us in trouble with any of that. Well, it it could. I mean, if you're if you're all chatting about an agendized item or an or an item that could be agendized, then yeah, it's just it's it's discussion. Yeah, I think I think the the question I would have there is how you all think about continuing conversations in between these meetings, right? And this is really only relevant if we're talking about launching specific spaces for committees and subcommittees, right? Um, you know, for example, if we make sure that every 
approved member of the committee or subcommittee is a part of the relevant roundtable community. I think the idea of, you know, avoiding walking quorum would be just giving people enough time to respond to um, questions or contributions within the community um, or having some kind of rules of the road around who can actually post and respond in, you know, the context of a roundtable community. Um, in some instances, they're more highly controlled, which means only the chairs can actually share min minutes, share agendas, and it really just becomes like a repository for members to engage with when they're looking to like get up to speed before meetings where quorum is established. Um, other committees, you know, use roundtable as a way to continue conversation in between, and the commitment is that, you know, all of those quote unquote threads will be open for a, a period of time in between some of the synchronous meetings, right? Again, I think this is a question that's specific, it sounds like, to the application of this tool for subcommittees and committees, which is something that other state agencies and you know COCs have done. Um, but there are other applications too that wouldn't be um, wouldn't be, I guess, getting in the way of any walking quorum if they're serving um, you know needs that come after the release of the strategic plan, right? If we want to build you know some sort of statewide learning or training hub, for example. Any other questions or thoughts for Austin? What I might end on briefly before getting you back to business is where we started with Brooke's question around how this actually comes to life. Um, what I want to ground folks in is a sense of sort of specificity, right? Making sure that we can all really wrap our hands around what it is we're doing together. Um, and we've got a playbook that um, has resonated with the ICHs, the state agencies, and the COCs that we that we work with. Um, so what we're looking to do here is start with a very clear um, problem and a specific group of people. Um, and that's what we configure the initial space around, whether that is a specific subcommittee within the broader ICH or a statewide peer group dedicated maybe to youth providers or veterans providers um, is sort of where we might want to spend time um, brainstorming what is most relevant to the priorities of the committee. Um, and that's where we then identify who that beta group might be. Um, and we're big believers, again, in really wanting to build this with direct feedback from the users we're serving. So it's not as if we're going to structure this massive statewide community and then flip a switch and launch it overnight. Um, we really want to make sure that we're doing this um, directly um, collaborating with the users that we want to serve, um, which I think starts with getting feedback from this subcommittee and then might grow into, um, you know, focusing on a specific cohort and a specific topic. And again, it's there that we get to Brooke's question around how we actually scale this across the state. Um, if the initial cohort we work with um, sees the meaning and, and the value of having this space to learn and grow, and they get energy out of being a part of it. We then follow our end users lead and say, hey, what is the next cohort that you want to build? Is it in the context of one COC or a peer group that might you know, benefit the state? And that's how we think about both the statewide communities that we build and you know, the COC specific communities we build. Um, it all starts with a single group, but with feedback from users and guidance from committees like yours, it can grow into something um, bigger that makes you know every practitioner from the front line up feel way more connected to each other and and to the mission of the work that they're doing. Chris, uh, I my question was: Is it possible to? Uh, limit the co have say the core core possible members can be this whole group, but I'm going to limit it to no more than three members that it, they can participate into it. That way, we, um, we're able to keep from any cohort being a quorum size. That's so we get away from the walking quorum issue. 
that's that's all that's all I have. Yeah, I, I think that's definitely possible from a product just perspective. You were able to you know work with the admins of your communities to um, set clear rules uh, in terms of who gets in to each of the communities that we built. Um, so if that is a way to protect against the walking quorum issue, um, it's definitely something we can we can do with you all. Any other questions, thoughts, ideas? This is Chris again for the record. I can see this as being a very valuable tool, you know, and it, it would be interesting to, um, especially in working with the strategic plan and our different committees, you know, there's there's a lot of ways I can see us using this. And so thank you for your time and your skills. I really appreciate that. Um, all thanks goes to the users we've been working with. Um, as Michelle knows, this product has evolved a whole lot in the past few years, um, and that's entirely credit to the agencies and COCs we've been working with. Um, so again, like conversations like these really do mean a lot in informing what this thing is today and what it'll be in the future. Um, so regardless of you know the outcome in the next few weeks and months, like please um, do follow up with questions, suggestions, ideas. Um, really enjoy coming back to groups like this to share out how we're growing and what we're doing um, and would be you know grateful for the opportunity to support um, as the plan evolves. Thank you so much, Austin. Anybody else? Thank you, Austin. Really appreciate you. Appreciate your time. So, and you know, at some point, somebody's going to ask you about the price point. So, uh, you're going to have to be able to answer that question. <laughs> I don't know where we're going to get the money to pay for that, but. <laughs> If the question is asked, that means that you see value in it. So it's a good problem to have um, and can assure you we'll we'll find a way to make it work. Um, so thank you again. Um, I'll drop my email in the chat if it's helpful. You know, folks want to follow up separately. I'm always happy to do these conversations one on one. Um, but for now, I'll leave you to it because I know it's a very, very packed agenda. So thank you again. Thank you. Okay, last call for comments around uh, the round table. Okay, so I'm going to, not seeing any uh, anybody for comments, I'm gonna go ahead and close that agenda item. Uh, before we move on to the next agenda item, um, Brooke, I'm going to ask if I can pass the t the baton to you and ask you to run the rest of this meeting. I just got a call that I have a family emergency that I need to uh, go deal with immediately. So um, if you don't mind, I would like to pass the rest of this meeting over to you. Okay. I hope everything's okay. Um, I hope so, too. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, everybody. Uh, I hope th is this, is, this isn't going to affect us with quorum, is it? No, we're still good. Okay, thank you. Again, I'm sorry, everybody. Hey, best wishes, Michelle. Okay, everyone, we're going to move on to uh, agenda. We are on agenda number six for possible action. We've got champions reports, and uh, we're going to do a status update from the COC and TA subcommittee members regarding their progress in developing content and language to be included in their assigned sections of the Nevada Strategic Plan on Homelessness. Discussion will include timelines for completion of action plans and updates will be populated during the meeting. So with that being said, um, do we have any updates from any continuums of care?
So either Northern, Southern, or looks like we lost uh, Michelle from our rural community, rural COC, but is there any other COCs on today? Ms. Chris, for the record, I Hi, did Chris. pass uh, our comments back to the COC after we had our strategic planning meeting. We're going through restructuring, so I don't think that the rural Nevada continuum of care is going to have uh, much input to the strategic plan at this time. What they're trying to do is in the in the restructuring is to get their uh, our rural continuum of care strategic plan more in line with our state one. Okay. And so that's that's about as much of an update as I can provide. Great. Thank you, Chris. All right. So it seems like um, we haven't had an update for a, for a while from the Southern Nevada Continuum of Care. So Shelly, I'm not sure what our outreach um, is for the Southern Nevada COC, but I'm wondering if we should maybe do um, some communication with Southern Nevada to see if they are able to attend these meetings or um, have some thoughts about input on this strategic plan. Yeah, I'll definitely make sure that we can reach out to them and get some communication going. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, and anything from Northern Nevada? We might want to, Shelly, also do some research, uh, outreach to Northern Nevada as well, just to get a pulse okay. as to their feedback on any action items. Okay. Okay, so now let's shift to go to our TA subcommittee uh, members and champions. Um, we had a deadline of May, March 31st to submit uh, a first draft of our um, goals and action plans based off of the, the strategic plans that our various different champions were working on. Um, and so with that being said, I think we could maybe go through our champions list and see who has some updates if folks want to speak to their groups. Um, thank you for pulling that up. Um, it looks like housing is first um, with Austin and I as champions. Um, and so we could uh, go through where our the housing work group landed in terms of action items. Um, and so the housing work group, we had a, a really consistent group of about nine different people that continuously met with us uh, for two weeks straight. Um, and we were just really grateful for the uh, engagement, the ongoing participation, and the ways in which folks um, provided thoughts and brainstorming um, that helped us compile information that we came up with for our potential action items. Um, and so I see here the, the goals, action plans, or, or the goals that we put together are in column A, B. Is that what that is, Shelley, for each goal? Yes. Do you need okay. Abigail to zoom in on that section by chance to help kind of? Um, I'm going to pull it up on my side because I've got um, a little okay. older eyes. And. Let me see, where did I? Um, and so for the housing work group. For goal one, we which was preserve the existing affordable and low income housing stock. Um, we did a kind of a SOAR analysis and came up with seven different action items um, that we are recommending um, be put in our draft for, for, for discussion. Um, and so the first one being create a preservation fund uh, with best practices, 
um, for private public partnerships for preservation. Um, um, and so thinking about who needs to create this preservation fund and and kind of what is this a state action? Is this legislative action, local action? I think that's where, you know, we didn't go as far as that next step, but wanted to sort of provide a draft for this body to kind of think about, you know, where do we go from here? But these were just based on our conversation. These are the action steps that we came up with. So the next one, establish consistent data tracking systems of units that need to be preserved and how long the affordable housing developments affordability period lasts. And this is, you know, if we're talking about preservation, we really need to understand what units are up um, as far as their preservation period. Um, and we need a database to sort of understand that. We're not sure if state government tracks that or local government tracks that, but that feels like a need. Um, and then the next one, regulate what the insurance companies can and cannot cover and their ability to increase rates and establish a cap of some sort, because it feels like insurance premiums are extremely high and impacting affordability. Um, action four, develop partnerships between affordable housing and with historic preservation and environmentalists um, and EDON, um, GOED and some of our business community, the Reno Historical Society, Desert Research Institute, Nevada Environmental Justice Alliance, University of Nevada, Reno, um, to preserve existing properties for affordable housing. And so kind of creating this ecosystem um, where we you know, leverage our expertise in the state to um, preserve existing uh, just historical communities. And then create a, an exit survey for affordable housing developers to understand why they sell to market rate developers. So when that affordability does come up for these developments, you know, really understand what is what is uh, if, if we are losing units out of our affordable housing stock, why is that and, and doing that exit survey? And then action six, establish consistent data tracking systems of units that need to be preserved and how long the affordable housing developments affordability period lasts. I think that might be a duplicate. Um, and then seven, investigate limiting the number of properties of out of state investors can purchase. Um, this feels like a major issue in the state where we've got out of state investors that are coming in and buying up multiple properties at one time. And so trying to figure out how to make sure we've got some control over um, what out of state speculators are purchasing. So that's our first goal. I'll just pause there to see if anybody has any thoughts on that. Any additions or comments? Okay, well, moving right along. Um, goal two, uh, this is the equitable access to housing and promoting that by addressing discrimination on the basis of prior justice involvement, source of income, mental health status, or involvement in a housing program. And so this goal is really geared towards addressing homelessness for people who can't get into a home. Um, and so the actions here that the committee uh, discussed was one, develop a tracking mechanism for new units and a system to track who is gaining access to housing uh, dis disaggregated by race and demographic data. Um, so really want to get to the granular details of where are, where are units, where are people being housed, and is there uh, racial disparities about that? Um, action two, develop policies that require housing interventions that are evidence-based solutions and research-based. Um, three, develop a standardized tenant selection housing policy for who can access housing, and ideally having one standard tenant selection plan that uh, is sort of standardized across our housing ecosystem. Um, four, develop a landlord liaison program to support education, training, coordination with landlords, invest in dedicated positions to improve landlord relationships, um, invest and develop accountability metrics to ensure investments are working. Um, number five, recommend policy changes to source of income discrimination and improve equitable access to housing. 
Uh, six, develop a public awareness campaign to address not in my backyard ism, um, educate elected officials, the affordable housing industry to reduce stigma and bias about housing access barriers and solutions. Uh, seven, prioritize the development of supportive housing that targets access to housing for specific populations. Launch a call to action by the governor's office to activate local leadership to prioritize housing access. Increase tenant protections to address rent control to prevent evictions. Uh, increase accountability of property managers to reduce barriers to entry. Develop consumer education on landlord tenant law and engage organizations like Legal Aid Plan and the ACLU on the strategy and approach to this process. Uh, 12, increase support, um, supportive services for people with disabilities, severe mental illness, substance use disorders to support access to housing and housing stability and increase the number of payees who can assist with fiscal management. And then lastly, for this prioritize policies that are tenant that are tenant rights focused and incentivize communities that have low barrier access to housing. All right, so that was a lot. Uh, 1.2, this is a major issue around homelessness, and I think that's why there's so many action items around equitable access, um, but I'll pause. See if anybody has any thoughts. Y'all are awfully quiet today. All right. No comments. Okay. Um, the next one is uh, 1.3. We've got five action items here and this one uh, this goal was to establish the infrastructure for our work group on supportive housing um, and this is to create an accountability for the state that we develop supportive housing and so one of the action items is to develop a statewide working group on supportive housing that's not bound by open meeting law provisions with membership that is representative of the geogra geographic racial and political diversity of the state of Nevada and has various sectors that uh, supportive housing impacts so various different um, populations like people experiencing homelessness, people from the justice sector, aging, disability services, uh, and so forth. The next one is um, develop a charter and governance structure that outlines the membership, the goals, responsibilities, time commitment, and the expectations of this group. Um, next, develop standardized data-driven processes, a robust community engagement practice to capture data and inform a statewide annual housing needs assessment to study and track the existing inventory, the development pipeline, the production, preservation, and loss over time of this uh, supportive housing stock. Um, and then fourth, develop a five-year statewide supportive housing plan that is regionally focused based on information from the needs assessment. And then five, uh, provide guidance and recommendations on the administration of supportive housing resources managed by state and local governments, including recommendations to ensure an alignment of capital services and operating sources. Any thoughts on, on 1.3? All right, moving right along, we got 1.4. Um, and this one is, this is about funding and the resources to support the necessary uh, uh, development of deeply affordable, below 30% area median income development, also 30 to 60% area median income or very low income housing, and also 60 to 100% of area median income um, affordable housing development. And so, uh, the first action identify dedicated permanent capital operating and service funding sources to support ongoing development and operations. Um, develop a statewide affordable housing dashboard that lives on the state's website that provides real time inventory of the affordable housing stock. Develop a multi sector housing plan for Nevada that includes a plan on addressing homelessness with housing and holds businesses accountable to contributing to the housing ecosystem of the communities by which their business is, is impacting. 
um, utilize the multi-sector housing plan as a tool to educate all elected officials at the state and local levels about the housing needs for their prospective areas, how addressing the housing need will inadvertently address the homelessness crisis they are also required to address. Um, number five, support the Nevada Housing Coalition with building the capacity of, of developers, property managers, service providers, and property partners to develop and operate high quality supportive housing. Um, identify gap financing for operating resources for deeply affordable housing. Identify bonus incentives to increase the production of deeply affordable housing, um, expedited zoning provisions, or relaxed processes for including at least 30% or more of units at or below 30% area median income. And then lastly, identify bonus uh, incentives to increase the production of deeply affordable housing, um, which I think is also a duplicate. So yeah, so that's the um, resources uh, to develop deeply affordable housing and, and housing at different interval levels. Any questions on that one? Okay, we've got two more goals under the housing working group. Um, the next one provides support to local communities and the continuum of care to maximize funding um, and ensure mainstream resources are leveraged to provide housing programs and supports. So uh, one goal is to create opportunities for exploratory funding resources for community based organizations, uh, create funds that are flexible to accommodate for operational changes or challenges community based organizations may face. So this is um, identifying more nimble funding sources. Um, action two: develop a flexible housing pool to fund subsidies, provide resources for housing related expenses that current funding does not support. Um, again, the need for more nimble funding sources. Um, action three, develop systems for Medicaid to interface with the continuum of care to discuss service resource allocations, understand target populations who um, are not covered for services, understand how long services are medically necessary for the target population in order to leverage Medicaid as a service funding source, and clearly understand who is covering what service types funding resources and for what which populations. Um, four, develop a statewide tracking system of all fund sources in the state and what they are used for and the eligibility criteria to access those funds. Clearly define what a statewide collaboration should look like between state agencies and the COC, conduct outreach to those entities. Six, engage with outreach and engagement at the universities to connect students to the issues related to housing and homelessness and ask students questions about what they think and, how, and ways to engage them in the solutions. And lastly, provide statewide funding on support services, best practices to the COCs to standardize service delivery practices. All right. And then lastly, goal six is promote innovation. Um, and opportunities for use of housing choice vouchers and shared housing, things like roommates or multifamily shared housing. And so for these, we've got um, apply for HUD technical assistance to do a community review of the current service array to understand what the gaps are in a given community and then define deliverables and ways to identify fund sources to fill those gaps. Um, identify ways to improve housing choice voucher utilization for northern Nevada and rural communities due to low landlord engagement, such as incentivizing landlords to maximize utilization of tenant based rental assistance programs. Um, develop a statewide risk mitigation fund um, incentives for property partners, regardless of subsidy programs. Uh, develop a roommate housing opportunity database system to connect people to potential roommate opportunities who are interested in shared housing. Um, invest in a study focus on compiling innovative housing strategies for addressing homelessness based on national examples. And then find resources to fund the uh, housing trust fund at the state and local level and identify properties for a potential property trust fund. All right, my mouth is dry. I'm gonna stop talking. Any questions about the housing working group? All right, seeing none, we're gonna go on to our next work group. 
Um, who is next? We've got strategy number two, the homeless prevention and intervention. Who's our chair for that one? Uh, Scott Benson or Karen Van Hess. I see you off camera, Karen. Hi. You're on mute. Sorry, I don't have anything on the homelessness prevention. Oh, because this is Pamela and myself. We have not met on this. Okay. All right. So for those committees that have not met, we definitely need to regroup about those. So let's save that topic for after this kind of overview of where we are. Um, so let's put an asterisk next to that one. How about the next one? Um, uh, is Noga on for the wraparound? Yes, service? I am. Here. Hi, Noga. And uh, mine are kind of long. <laughs> so if you think your mouth was dry, <laughs> mine is about to be. <laughs> uh, and I have it like on a Word document because for me it's better. Uh, this is again, um, older eyes looking at this. So I am going to look at my screen here where it's large and I can read. <laughs> Um, so I guess for uh, goal um, number one, I'm not mistaken, increase access. Yeah, there we go. Um, simplify the application process uh, for continuum of care providers to access matching funds, reduce, re reduce, reduce bureaucratic hurdles and paperwork, making it easier for organizations to apply. Um, offer capacity building grants to help uh, COCs providers develop strong grant writing skills and build robust proposals to align with state with state agency priorities. Uh, provide technical assistance and training sessions to continuum of care providers on how effectively access and utilize matching funds. Uh, this could include workshops or financial management reporting uh, requirements and program evaluation. Encourage partners and collaboration between uh, COCs, providers, and state agencies. Uh, this could involve uh, joint planning, resource sharing, and coordinating service delivery to maximize the impact of matching funds. Implement performance-based funding mechanisms where COC providers receive matching funds based on their ability to meet specific performance metrics and outcomes related to wraparound services. Offer incentive for innovative approaches to providing wraparound services. Uh, it could include bonus funding for programs that demonstrate creativity, effectiveness, scalability, and addressing the needs of vulnerable populations. Explore flexi flexible funding models that allow COC providers to use matching funds for a variety of purposes, including staff training, technology upgrades, and client assistance funds to better meet the diverse needs of the community. Engage community stakeholders, including service recipients, in the decision making process regarding the allocation of matching funds. This will ensure that funding priorities reflect the actual needs and preferences of population being served. Um, establish mechanisms for data sharing and outcome tracking between COC providers and state agencies. This promotes transparency, accountability, and continuous improvement in the use of matching funds. Advocate for increased funding allocations for wraparound services at the state level um, and raise awareness about the importance of these services in supporting individuals and families experiencing homelessness or other forms of crisis. Any questions? And again, this was just this was just kind of like a, something just kind of put together, um, you know, as a first draft. Mm -hmm. Brooke, did you have something to say or? No, I was just saying oh. great list. Thank you so much. Sorry. Oh, yeah, no problem. OK, moving on to uh, this uh, goal number two. Again, lengthy. Um, <laughs> um, overview of homelessness in Nevada. Provide statistics and data on the current state of homelessness in Nevada, including demographics, trends, and key challenges faced by individuals and families experiencing homelessness. Impact of homelessness. Outline the social, economic, and health related impacts of homelessness on individuals, families, communities, and the state as a whole. 
highlight the costs associated with homelessness, including emergency services, health care utilization, and criminal justice involvement. Best practices and evidence-based strategies. Oh, strategies, sorry. Um, summarize best practices and evidence-based strategies for preventing and ending homelessness, drawing on research and successful inter interventions implemented in Nevada and elsewhere. This could include housing first approach approaches, rapid rehousing programs, supportive housing models, and coordinated entry systems. Local success stories showcase successful initiatives and programs implemented in Nevada, communities that have effectively reduced homelessness or provide innovative solutions that address housing instability, include testimonials from service providers, clients, and community stakeholders to demonstrate the impact of these interventions. Um, collaborative partnerships highlight collaborative partnerships between government agencies, nonprofit organizations, faith based groups, businesses, and community stakeholders in Nevada that have been instrumental in addressing homelessness, emphasize the importance of multi sector collaboration and collective impact in achieving sustainable solutions. Targeted investment opportunities. Identify specific areas for strategic investment to prevent and end homelessness in Nevada, such as expansion of affordable housing stock, support for homelessness prevention programs, including rental assistance, eviction prevention, and financial literacy education. Funding for supportive services, including mental health and substance abuse treatment, case management, employment assistance, and life skills, skills training. Investments in data systems and technology to improve coordination, monitoring and evaluation of homelessness initiatives, capacity building for grassroots organizations and community-based providers serving vulnerable populations. Uh, ROI, return on investments, provide an analysis of the potential ROI of investing in homelessness prevention and intervention, intervention efforts, including cost savings to public systems, increased economic stability for individuals and families, and improved community well-being. Um, and a call to action will be clear call to action for potential funders, urging them to invest in evidence-based st strategies, Oh my God, I can't say that word today. Uh, strategies and collaborate with local stakeholders to prevent and end homelessness in Nevada. Provide contact information for, for further inquiries and opportunities for partnership. So, Olga, I do have a question. So, sure. all of these action steps are related to what was the goal for this? Uh, let me read it. Uh, number two. Provide materials to potential funders regarding best practices, strategies, and interventions in Nevada communities for strategic investment to prevent and end homelessness. So, is is the intent of the work group that that all of these and all of this information would be provided to funders? Correct. To address this goal. Correct. Okay. I know it's lengthy. Like I said, I have a lot of stuff. We can definitely, you know look at it and see what we can fix or not. And did you all discuss in your work group about who uh, you know what I we did we did get together. Uh, we had an initial meeting and kind of had um, uh, just you know just throwing kind of ideas together and then I opened it to the um, the those that um, went to the conference and wanted to collaborate with uh, you know, with the different uh, goals and whatnot. And I kind of just threw to them uh, just a basic uh, uh, shared document and uh, didn't get a whole lot of uh, reply back or anything, but um, um, just uh, kind of uh, just a few things that they were kind of adding to the to the mix. And, and then I kind of just put it together. And no, I did not have time to meet with Karen or Pamela after I kind of put everything together. OK. So I'm wondering, um, in the interest of time, I'm wondering yes. if the committee would entertain, if we should uh, think about, based on what we've heard thus far, if we should uh, start thinking about the actionable steps or um, timelines or like act 
actors of where these types of activities would live and maybe having that discussion as a group because I feel like this action plan um, these are good first steps to have um, but kind of without talking about where these actions would live they kind of are just actions right so what are your thoughts about that uh, yeah I I agree absolutely Okay, so if we go back to the beginning of your goal one, oh God, um, um, increase access to matching of funds from the state agencies to the continuum of care providers to improve wraparound services. Okay, so where would a lot of these action steps, who do you think it would naturally live? Are these COC types of action steps or is this a different type of actor? Um, I will say uh, probably COCs, um, I, you know, again, um, I think it would probably be the best idea for me to get with my group and just kind of uh, disseminate this a little bit uh, just to make sure we have a better, clear, um, better, clear, like, you know, uh, plan of action and whatnot. But there might be multiple because there are some things might be identifying like funders, to have, like find capacity building grants, like um, but okay. And then part of our work too is to develop a timeline of when these activities would take place. Right. <clears throat> um, does anybody have any thoughts on on any of these? action steps as far as actors or timelines? This is Chris, uh, for the record. I think that uh, what would be really helpful for me is to, to actually see the comments from the different subcommittees, because this is just a, a whole lot of information. Mm -hmm. And to be actually be able to see it where I can go through it line by line and digest it and maybe play with it a little bit and get get so I can get my head around wrapped around it. That's okay. that's just for me. Okay. I think it's a really important feedback, Chris. Um, and so how many um Shelly, how many of these reports don't we have? Maybe we should look at that and have a conversation about the gaps. I believe we're missing three. Three? Okay. So based on that feedback, Chris, um, maybe we could do some outreach to the three three chairs that we are missing information for and work to compile this document so we have all of the initial draft and get this out to all of the committee members and ask for committee members to review this information and provide feedback on who they think would be uh, the ideal actor for each of the actions. Um, and maybe a, a proposed timeline for these or something by, by the time we meet again. That's a lot to ask, but any thoughts on that? This is Karen for the record. I think that sounds like a plan. I 
I have a question regarding, um, and I don't know if we can see it, but Scott Benton is the champion for that, um, the one group. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember him being on here last month or anything because there's no there's no communication with him. Mm -hmm. OK, so Shelly, do we know uh, if if any of the members that are listed as champions are no longer are, are part of the 10 that we identified as current members? Are they all part of the 10? Yes, except for Shannon. OK. Do we have a record of when Scott has the last time that he was in one of our meetings? I have all of 2024 and it doesn't show that he's been in any. Abigail, do you have access to 2023 to see when his last? Um, we can go ahead and check. Um, so it might make sense maybe for our next meeting to kind of reassign whatever the work groups if we don't have reports for these and if they haven't met with our new members coming online maybe we could have a conversation about reassigning those work groups um, and providing some some time to get those work groups to, to work and provide some some actionable steps Thank you, Paige. Brooke. Okay. And then, so the ones that we have that we need that information for, it sounded like homelessness prevention and intervention. Um, and do we have information for education and workforce development? Was that part of the spreadsheet too? No, no, so we need education and workforce development. Okay. So maybe if we could do some outreach to Scott and Dr. Pam to see if their intentions on the committee. Abigail was able to pull the last time Scott was present was for the September subcommittee meeting. Okay. Okay. All right, so we got to see what's going on with Scott, what's going on with Pam. And then is the last one that you don't have for policy, because I realized today that that might have been one that was my oversight that you all might have not have received. Oh, you do have policy. Great. Y'all are fast. Thank y'all. <laughs> um, what is the third one is it just education and homeless prevention So 
So if that's the case, then we will um, go ahead and the action for this step then would be for us to get this spreadsheet out to the committee so everybody can review the culmination of what we have thus far. And, and we would ask for committee members to please take some time, review the action steps that the work groups have put together uh, and come to the next meeting with your thoughts, um, thoughts about um, actors of kind of where these action steps sh should live um, uh, and thoughts about timeline and any feedback that you have about any of these action steps. Um, there's a lot of action steps in here. So if there's also thoughts about if you see some duplication, because that was also came up as um, topic of conversation that some things may have come up in other work groups because there might be some overlap. Um, and so if you notice that there's some duplication um, to highlight that, so that might help us also scale back and, and reduce duplication. Um, but we want to come back and have a conversation about this uh, and, and, and maybe work through this and uh, flesh out our, our plan. And then we will work with to find out the intention of Scott and Pamela to move forward and then reassign the education and the homeless prevention work groups um, at our next meeting when we have hopefully our new members present and see if there's other new champions that would want to take on those those work groups. All right, anything else on this action item? Or topic? All right. Well, thank you all. Um, we'll go to the next agenda item, which is um, number seven for information only. Discuss discussion of agenda items for the next meeting on May 21st. Um, so it sounds like we definitely want to have an opportunity to um, reassign these. Um, strategic issues to new to committee members. So if that needs to be like a a possible action item where we can do that. And then we'll keep our champions report so we can go over the feedback from what you, everybody's going to review from the working groups. Um, any, anybody have any thoughts about any agenda items? This is Lorena um, for the record. Would we also, because I know we're all going to get a copy of this, but we're going to also reserve, are we also going to reserve a little bit of time to talk about like our thoughts or like feedback on what was sent to us and that we got to review? Yes. Yeah. So we, I'm wondering, should that be, a, you, you want that, think that should be a separate agenda item, Lorena? Like discussion um, item? Yeah, I think I think so, just because like we're obviously going to reassign the other ones, but I think we should also have a conversation about any feedback just because mm -hmm. I know like we can make our comments and we can send them in and see what a what a, what it is. But maybe having a discussion of like we read everybody's stuff. This is kind of what our feedback is and mm -hmm. then have more of like. Editing a, the whole document. Right. Instead mm -hmm. of having like a bunch of little documents with little comments and then actually making edits to the main document, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So having an opportunity to discuss our comments. OK.
I'm wondering if there's a need for us to have a conversation with um, the continuum of care leads about this strategic plan and the role that we as a committee and the interagency council probably need in terms of like cohesion with the continuums of care um, and maybe have a conversation or a dialogue about how to partner on this process. Um, this is Lorena for the record, I agree. I don't know if we can maybe invite them and just have like a a, a discussion, not necessarily a presentation, but like a discussion about the impact of the strategic plan. Um, Also, this is Raina for the record on a different note for the new um, members that will be joining us. I don't know if we can make like a little slot to kind of do like an intro of like what our group is exactly and what um, we're working on and stuff like that. Just because I know when I joined, I was a little lost. Mm. Um, <laughs> and so I think it would be helpful for them if they do come to our next meeting to just get like um a time to just explain like what have we been working on, what are we about, and then their roles in our group moving forward pretty much. So they can kind awesome. of get excited. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great idea, Lorena. Thank you. So having like a min, like an orientation, <laughs> new member, yeah. season member orientation. Is that something, Shelly, that your team could help us facilitate? Yeah, absolutely. OK, thank you so much. All right, any other agenda item topics? All right. Well, seeing none, we'll close this agenda uh, item number seven. Now we'll go to a, uh, item eight, general public comments. This is our second public comment period. No action may be taken upon a matter raised under this item of the agenda until the matter itself has been specifically included on an agenda as an item upon which action may be taken. Comments will be limited to three minutes. If you are making a public comment via phone, please call 1775. 321-6111 and you can use ID 847-312-658 and pound. And we are now open for public comment. All right, anybody on the phone? Okay, seeing none, we will close agenda item number eight. And um, now uh, number nine, we are at adjournment. It is 3.03 .03 p.m. And I will adjourn this meeting of the Interagency Council on Homelessness to Housing Subcommittee Technical Assistance at 3.03 .03 p.m. Thank you all so much. Thank you, have a good one. Have a good one. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, bye-bye.